dynamics of plasma, which is often forgotten about in favor of its more commonly encountered counterparts, such as solids, liquids, and gases. Plasma is obviously a very distinct state of matter characterized by a collection of free-moving charged particles, ions, electrons, shit like that. Well, that's one way to put it, I guess. As I progress through here, I'm hoping to... Well, I will cover the conditions under which plasma forms. I'll cover its unique, unique uh, conductive properties, among other things. And its pivotal role in various applications, like industrial pro uh, processes, and astrophysical phenomenon. Even though this is a plasma physics lecture, it has a lot to do with astrophysics. So I hope you join me now and begin this journey into the intriguing world of plasma physics. Ooh. Yeah, it sounds fancier than it is, I think. Plasma, which is, you know, like I said, it's frequently referred to as the fourth state of matter and follows solids and liquids and gases. And, constitutes approximately 99% of all visible matter in the universe. So it's uh, definitely an extraordinarily common yet often overlooked state of matter. You know, it's all around us, so let's break it down. What the fuck is it, and how can we use it to generate power and shit like that, nuclear fusion reactors and so on, so... But, I don't know, maybe first I should do some housekeeping. I'm going to mostly lay out the lamestream, mainstream views. My personal views may vary, you know, regarding much of this, perhaps. So, In other words, I'm going to explain why the book, so to speak. I just want to throw that out there, because I don't need basic bitches chirping, because they got shit twisted. Oh, he said this, blah, 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 yeah, fuck off. <clears throat> First of all, what the fuck is in even is a plasma, you might ask. You know, it's essentially, it's just a gas, just like the gas in your bedroom, so to speak. But instead of neutral atoms, we've added enough energy to the gas to make it so hot that the electrons, or at least some of them, become detached from the atoms. So you have free electrons running around the plasma. And then you have positively charged ions left behind from the atoms that were there. And you have these charged species, so to speak, running around the plasma. So it's essentially, you could say it's an electrically conductive gas. It's a gas that conducts electricity. Now, if we stop there, you know, it doesn't really sound all that exciting. So I'm going to break it down a little bit deeper here. Like I said, I repeat prepared some notes, but I'm winging it, so forgive me if I make some mistakes, but let's imagine some examples. Um, perhaps the most famous example I'll use first is the plasma ball that we all marveled over this shit as kids, you know? Touch the glass and all the swirly colored flame lightning looking shit goes right for where your fingers touch the ball. Well, you can see these tendril-like things of pink and bluish kind of light reaching out. And you can kind of sort of notice the instability there. You know, uh, the plasma is not a fixed object. It's always moving and whirling and dancing away. And I'm going to talk about why it turns out that this behavior happens because of the charge nature. And break it down really simply. And... Uh, and of the electrically conductive gas, uh, basically it's charged and it moves like that, and that actually makes it hard as fuck to contain a plasma <laughs> subsequently, uh, especially for something like a fusion reactor. That's what makes the challenge of this uh, alleged nuclear fusion really difficult, so they say. You know, nuclear is a whole other can of worms I'm not really interested in discussing right now. Anyways, so beyond that toy plasma dome, the next example, you might know what I'm talking about. It obviously is called fucking lightning. If you don't know what lightning is, I don't know where the fuck you've been living, but it's that brilliant flash of light we see in the sky during a thunderstorm. 
It's actually breaking down the gas particles between the cloud and the ground or between two clouds generating an ionized gas. Gas, ether, or both. That's also another discussion. That I'm not here to talk about the fucking atmosphere. I cover that shit enough. So it's a gas where some of the electrons have been stripped of the atoms. And that's lightning. So another example I can give you that everybody knows who the fuck is a neon sign, which, you know, often has phrases like, now open or come inside or some shit, you know. They're not just eye-catching advertisements. They're legit practical demonstrations of plasma in action. These signs admit their own characteristic orange, blue, or other colors. You know, and this is due to the plasma form within their tubes. For the completely new... Uh, useless clueless noobs in the back when an electric current passes through the gas inside a neon sign it causes the electrons to be stripped of their atoms creating the growing glowing plasma we see so this glow is visible a totally visible result of the energy released when free electrons um when they recombine with the positively charged ions so i'll break that down a little bit further in a little bit but another example is uh the northern lights that you see at the alleged poles of earth the alleged northern lights something i love fucking talking about so they say they say the aurora is said to be because of the earth is getting hit by solar wind and it interacts with our magnetic field, colliding with the atmosphere, it gases, and that we have on top of the atmosphere, allegedly creating the mesmerizing dancing display we all love to watch. I love the Northern Lights, so it's it's hard for me not to talk about the stuff and go on a big rant right now. I just wanted to point that out. I could be go into all sorts of shit, but I'm not gonna. Anyways, it looks a lot like a plasma because that's basically what it is what we're seeing is the atoms of our own atmosphere lose their electrons and recombine giving us this light but notice that the aurora is also dancing and waving it's not just static just like the temporal entangled ether that permeates all of space and time but that's another conversation bringing this up again and again because it's a pretty important characteristic of plasmas. It's also a, obviously a characteristic of the ether, like I said, but I'll save this etheric medium talk for the uh, experts like, like Shinku. Uh, man, Shinku, I fucking love your posts, bro. Anyway, if you want to know about the ether, don't really follow me, but follow uh, Shinku there. Plasmas are really complex in model and control, and obviously to contain. Speaking of Shinku, he pointed this out the other day. Another example of plasma from everyday experience is a flame, which we don't typically think of a flame as being a plasma, but it really is a chemical reaction going on there that involves the transfer of electrons. You know, there's oxygen and then combining with whatever the fuel is as a transfer of electrons they're they're basically moving around and she gets very hot so when we get things hot like this there's always going to be some fraction of these electrons which can become detached from the atoms and then of course recombine and when the electrons come back into the atom and recombine with the atom a photon is released ah, light so the flame that we see is essentially you know, these electrons coming back into their orbits. If you really want to dig deep into it. So there's a plasma there as well. Flame is definitely a plasma. Well, the mainstream says that solar flares and CMEs are plasmas. They both involve plasma and can occur together. Many people don't even fucking know that they are different phenomena. And solar flares are said to be primarily irradiation bursts. Well, CMEs are actual ejections of plasma. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna bullshit about our electric sun though. Right now, you all get enough posts and shit like that for me. So, 
These bastards lie and say our son is a gigantic fucking fusion reactor in the sky that we move around a ball of plasma many, many times the size of Earth. No, it's so scary. My God. It's gigantic ball of plasma and these dumbasses worship or some shit. I digress. So, all this, all the alleged instabilities you see in the atmosphere of the sun. All these beautiful arcs and loops and shit like that. That beautiful, that beautiful CGI. Yeah, I'm totally digressing. Anyway, so I think I've brought up a few times now. That, um, maybe not. You know, this, I, I got to get the point across. Uh, it's, it's plasma is definitely not a stationary thing. It's just like the ether. And uh, I'm going to get back to that in a bit. Um, so just keep that shit in the back of your mind. Um, they say that plasma comprises something of like 99.99% of the visible universe. Like I said, all the stars are made of plasma and also nebulas in, in intergalactic space. And uh, galactic space is also plasma. So most of the matter in the universe is actually plasma. They allege we just happen to live on a pear-shaped cold rock with a purely theoretical swirling fucking molten core where the electrons have come back into the orbits of the atoms and so it's not a plasma here on Earth other than lightning and other examples and shit I talked about and also some unmentioned shit. I said plasma is a gas. It's a, an ionized gas. Gas is what I'm talking about. And I'm going to break this down a little bit further because I want you to understand what a plasma actually fucking is. So... Let's consider the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest of all the atoms often used to create plasma. So while any atom can be used to form plasma, hydrogen is particularly favored in fusion because, especially the research, due to its simplicity. So other gases like xenon and argon are used in various applications like thrusters and whatever else. The neutral uh, hydrogen atom consists of a nucleus with a single proton, which is, for the noobs in the back, denoted as P. And subsequently, it has a single electron orbiting around it. I'm not going to explain that shit for the noobs. Figure it out. So, this classical picture of the hydrogen atom resembling a miniature solar system is not quite accurate, though. I mean... Quantum mechanics teaches us that electrons don't orbit the nucleus in neat little paths, but exist as wave-like entities that essentially envelop the nucleus. I can definitely agree with that. Everything is wave. So this wave nature is more pronounced when considering multiple, multiple electrons. So while protons are made up of quarks, allegedly, and exhibit wave-like properties too, the details are complex, and I'm not going to get into that shit, and they delve into the realm of quantum physics, obviously, so. Fighting the urge to talk particle physics now. I just wanted to throw that out there again. My focus and professionalism here should be commended. I'm trying to stick to this particle physics. So, essentially, any, everything in the quantum level is made of waves. I'll just leave it at that. That's obviously a topic for another deep discussion. Anyway, getting back to this hydrogen, imagine the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest type of atom, really, consists of one proton, which has a positive charge, and one electron, which has a negative charge. So when we look at this atom from a distance, the positive and negative charges cancel each other out. For the noobs in the back, obviously... You know, in algebra, if you take the positive charge of a proton, which is like a plus one, and add it to the negative charge of the electron, which is like a minus one, they cancel each other out, and you end up with zero. If you can't see that, then you're following the wrong count. Anyway, from afar, the hydrogen atom, um, it appears to have no charge, really, when you look at it this way. So we describe this shit as being neutral. Now, if we have a large number of these hydrogen atoms together, like, say, like a trillion of them in a container floating around in space, this entire collection still appears neutral from a distance. So, 
It's neutrality is the, the reason why the gas is around us, like the air we breathe or the window side. They don't typically conduct electricity under normal conditions. If you needed me to tell you that, well, again, you're following the wrong count. Uh, these electrons and atoms, they're pretty tightly bound to their respective protons, and they're, they're not free to move around. But if we were to add a significant amount of energy to this system, you know, maybe in the form of heat or electrical energy, we could force the electrons to detach from their protons. I could talk about a lot of things here, and I'm going to resist the urge to. So, anyways, when this separation occurs, we no longer have neutral hydrogen atoms. Instead, we have free protons and free electrons, which these free particles can obviously move independently and are also capable of conducting electricity. Oh, you don't say. So, this state of matter where charged particles are unbound, free to move. Is known as plasma. Ah, plasma. So by adding this energy to gas, we essentially create a plasma, transforming a non-conductive gas into a conductive state due to the presence of free, unbound charged particles. You know, this is obviously a pretty fucking fundamental concept in understanding how different states of matter behave. You know, especially under various energy uh, conditions. So for us. <clears throat> Pardon me while I drink some coffee. You know, we should consider ice, which is uh, obviously water in solid form. You know, in this state, the water molecules are pretty tightly bound in a rigid structure. I don't need to tell you that. Here in Canada, we got lots of ice. Yeah, you know, obviously, when you add heat to the ice, it absorbs that energy undergoes a phase change, transforming that ice into water. You know, in this liquid form, the, molecule, the molecules, they're no longer fixed in place. They got enough energy to move around and flow past each other, do as they please, basically. So if we continue to add heat to the water, you know, obviously the molecules become increasingly agitated. And and we see the boiling effect eventually. Eventually, they gain enough energy to break free from the liquid surface, though. Enter the gas phase as water vapor, you know, steam. And if you don't you know, understand evaporation, you should leave now. <laughs> so by simply adding heat energy, you know, transition from solid to gas, from uh, solid to liquid, and then to a gas, so. Let's take this gas and add even more energy. So as these molecules move faster and collide with each other, they're going to gain enough kinetic energy to overcome the forces holding these electrons in orbit around each other, around their nuclei. So if we add a lot of heat, say a few thousand degrees, these uh, collisions can knock off some electrons, knock them free, resulting in ionization. So the gas then becomes a plasma with electrons and ions, charged atoms moving independently. So apart from the heat, we can also achieve ionization using a strong electric field. That's important to note, like the ones used in neon tubes or uh, plasma balls. Electric field is a vector field with both magnitude and direction. For those in the back, it exerts a force on charged particles, pushing positive charges in one direction and subsequently negative charges in the opposite direction. And by applying a strong voltage, voltage across a gas, we can create an electric field that pulls the electrons away from the protons. So if the electric field is strong enough, we can separate the electrons from their orbits, orbits which leads to ionization. And of course, once ionized, Charged particles move along with such velocity, they may recombine with other ions or maybe just continue moving independently, you know, depending on the collisions they experience. So this is how we can transform a neutral gas into a plasma, which is capable of conducting electricity, I might add, due to the presence of free moving charged particles. So Plasma, like I said, it's essentially a state of matter where atoms have been ionized. You know, this means 
electrons have been detached from their atoms. In other words, so when we start to start with a gas tube full of gas and apply the voltage to it, like the neon sign, we're essentially adding energy to the system. So initially, only a small fraction of the atoms will become an ionized. So when you switch on that neon light, you see it flickers for a second. Then it turns on and glows nicely. So as we continue to add more energy, more of these atoms are going to obviously become ionized, increasing what we call the ionization fraction. So it's actually quite challenging to uh, achieve complete ionization where every single atom is ionized. Believe it or not, that would uh, this requires a tremendous amount of energy to ensure that each electron and proton has enough energy to fully actually become detached. So typically gases are only partially ionized, like uh, like those neon tubes, only a small fraction of the gas is actually ionized. So in an ionized gas, you have a mix of high energy electrons moving freely, protons or other types of ions moving around. And a lot of neutral atoms, and it's rare to have a fully ionized plasma. Usually it's a mixture of ionized and as well as neutral particles. <clears throat> when an electron, though, through a random collision, say, approaches a proton, just the right angle and energy, it doesn't necessarily bounce off, but re-enters the orbit of the proton. And this is what I'm talking about, this recombination. As the electron falls back into orbit, a photon is released. This photon is the light we see in various phenomena. Again, if I have to explain this basic shit, you're following the wrong account. You know, like this light from lightning is due to the electrons re-entering the orbit of atoms, is one way to put it. So, the same goes for the glow of that plasma ball, the shimmering lights of the aurora, allegedly. I don't believe that. And also, obviously, the flame of a candle, like I mentioned. And these are all quite visible results of the electrons recombining with ions, essentially. I hope you... I'm going to put up a graphic of the hydrogen atom for the noob so they can see what the fuck I'm talking about. Maybe that'll help them. So, in the glass tube where this energy is continuously added, there's a constant cycle of ionization and recombination. That's why the light stays on. So some of these atoms are ionized and some recombine, releasing photons. The cycle creates a steady state where light's admitted at a consistent rate. Maybe though, maybe I'll spell this shit out for the, those in the back. A cycle essentially creates a steady state where light is admitted at a constant rate. Uh, the key takeaway is that we don't actually see the plasma itself. We see the light produced by the recombination of electrons with ions. I'm going to say that twice. We don't actually see the plasma itself. We see the light produced by the recombination of electrons with the ions. So if we had a fully ionized plasma with so much energy that none of the particles could recombine, it would actually be completely transparent. The highest energy plasmas are visible to us. We really only observe the light emitted when these particles recombine. So it's an important concept to understand, when, especially when studying the behavior of plasmas and their role in various natural and artificial phenomena. So before uh, I continue, I gotta say again, uh, Following is so not exactly how I view the sun, because if you aren't absolutely fucking new to my account, you already know. But they say the surface of the sun is measured at something like approximately 5,500 degrees Celsius or some shit, which is incredibly hot. And they say the hydrogen, the ad uh, helium, which allegedly make up the sun's outer layer, exist in a plasma state. So. Many of these at, uh, atoms are ionized, but not all of them. So if the sun was fully ionized, it would be invisible to us because there would be no recombination to reproduce the light. You know, anyways, let's 
consider the alleged core of the sun or the apparent nuclear, alleged nuclear fusion occurs. It sounds so epic. Nuclear fusion. Right? It's a bunch of bullshit is what it is. And they say the temperature here soars to 15 million degrees Celsius. Like, how the fuck do they even get this fucking... These numbers, like, my God. Could you go any higher? What about 20? Why don't you just make it, like, 50 million fucking degrees Celsius? Like, honestly. Anyway, this extreme heat is said to be necessary for fusion to take place, you know, despite the sun's alleged massive gravitational force, another topic I'm not going to talk about, which is apparently strong enough to push protons together and overcome their natural... National uh, natural repulsion. They they say the core isn't completely ionized, so I want this to sink in because this is I'm talking about the electromagnetic force here, which obviously governs the repulsion and attraction between charged particles, and is significantly stronger than not a force, but everyone calls it a fucking force. Stupid gravity. You know, I'm talking about Coulomb's Law for those in the back. So Coulomb's Law is this principle that explains the forces of attraction and repulsion, repulsion between two charged particles, something I've covered a lot. It tells us the uh, strength of this force depends on two main factors, the magnitude of the charges and obviously the distance between them. So the closer the charges are to each other, obviously the greater the magnitudes, the stronger the force will be. So the context of plasma and nuclear fusion, like what they allege occurs in the sun's core, Coulomb's law is pretty crucial, so it aids in the big lie that why, despite this alleged intense gravitational force of the sun, the protons within its core don't easily come together to fuse. Do you see how that works? Do I gotta spell it out for you? Anyways... The make-believe extreme conditions at the sun's core, where these alleged temperatures are said to reach millions of degrees, these protons move so fast and with such energy that they can occasionally overcome this repulsive force. So when they do, they collide and fuse, releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the process. That's what they say. This fusion is said to be the source of the sun's power. And it's fucking magical make-believe bullshit. Pseudoscience is what I say, but I digress. So while not a force, but everyone calls it a fucking force, gravity is what's said to hold the stars together. And it's said it's the balance between the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force that actually allows nuclear fusion to occur in the first fucking place. So... Are you catching on to something here? My sharp ones now. I don't gotta spell it out. Anyway, this Coulomb's law gives us a way to calculate and predict the behavior of these charged particles, which is obviously essential for understanding the processes that power the stars allegedly produce the natural, more importantly, produce this natural phenomenon that we actually observe in the world and universe. So when protons collide with the sun's core, they say the gra gravitational force must be so immense and uh, enough to overcome their electric propulsion and allow them to fuse into helium nuclei, releasing energy in this process. So this is why stars need to be large. Only a substantial gravitational force can induce fusion, allegedly. You see how this works? Is this... Anyway... <laughs> Let's get back to this lightning. You know, it's temperatures can reach around 20,000 degrees Celsius, which is super considerable. So, this intense heat of lightning is a result of the rapid movement and collision of ions driven by the electromagnetic force. So, the temperatures of plasma in different contexts, like the supposed sun's surface and core, and lightning, these are crucial for the processes that occur within them. They say the surface of the sun allows us to witness sunlight through this recombination. And the core's heat allows, enables this fusion. 
<clears throat> high temperatures, the lightning, you know, definitely showcases the power of electromagnetic force in nature. I don't know about all that other sun shit. It's all garbage. But you can see how, how cool lightning is and what an interesting plasma that is. You know, these temperatures are key to understanding the behavior of plasma, the forces at play in these very energetic properties. So, um, let's, let's talk about the flame again, although not as intensely hot as other plasmas. Is, the flame reaches about 1400 degrees or so, so this heat is sufficient to detach the electrons from the gas molecules in the flame, which then obviously recombine and emit photons, like I mentioned. Making this really, though, makes a flame of plasma. And uh, back to those neon signs, you know, despite the fact that various gases can be used to produce the different colors, uh, neon emits the classic, you know, orange red glow, argon and xeon create their own unique hues. You should look that step up. In the case of fluorescent bulbs, a similar process occurs, obviously, but that bulb contains a gas that when ionized uh, emits protons, photons, sorry. And the photons strike the bulb's inner surface, which is coated with a phosphorescent material. So this converts the photons into visible light. Much of the light initially emitted by these gases is the uh, in the ultraviolet range, but the coating that they tell you not to inhale, this is what turns uh, it into light. Let's see for our eyes. And an intriguing aspect to consider is the electron temperature within the plasma of a fluorescent bulb, which they say is about 11,000 Kelvin. This doesn't this may seem confusing since touching a fluorescent bulb reveals it to only be warm, not hot. But um, it's important to understand that what we mean by temperature in this context, it uh, refers to the average kinetic energy of electrons. So with ionization, a free electron possesses so much energy that it equates to a temperature of around 11,000 degrees, which sounds impressive. But in plasma, it's like... Uh, those in fluorescent bulbs, only a small fraction of the gas is actually ionized, so the majority remains neutral atoms. Um, the electrons with high energy, they do warm the bulb, but there's just too few of them to heat it to the point of melting or feeling hot to the touch. Um, I'll point this out because this concept is kind of crucial when considering fusion reactors where the aim to create plasmas with a super high ionization uh, fraction, tremendous energy, and to prevent the to prevent the reactor from melting, <laughs> they gotta you know contain this plasma within a magnetic field essentially, which acts like a magnetic bottle because uh, the plasma's contact with the with the reactor's wall could uh, you know. Cause them to melt, obviously. So they got to do fancy shit to contain that plasma. I'm not going to get into talk max and all that stuff. Um, it's just essential to note that the concept of plasma is not exclusive to hydrogen. I got to throw that in there. It applies to any of these elements, which is why I brought them up. Each each element can form plasma under the right conditions. I'm going to say that again. Each element can form a plasma under the right conditions. I'll t let you take a minute. Let that fucking sink in while I have some coffee and light this cigarette. And have to forgive me. I'm pretty tired. I'm running on a few hours of sleep. Stuff's fresh in my head. I wanted to get it out. Before I move on, um, I kind of want to break down the structure and, uh, behavior of the yellow um some some stuff here so neon represented on the periodic table obviously um, with the atomic number 10 is a nucleus comp comp composed of uh, 10 protons so subsequently has 10 neutrons surrounding the nucleus neon has 10 electrons 
distributed energy level. So the first two electrons occupy the innermost energy level, while the remaining eight are in the second energy level. Um, it's important to note, while we often visualize electrons as particles orbiting the nucleus, they are actually better described as wave-like entities with different shapes and configurations and various orbitals. So I mentioned that wave-like shit before, so anyways, I digress. For simplicity, we'll just stick to basic shit here. When an electric field is applied to a neon gas, it exerts a force on the charged particles, like I mentioned. The protons in the nucleus are unaffected due to the location, but the electrons, particularly those in the outer energy level, experience a force pushing them in the opposite direction of the field. Some of you are going to, some things just clued in there for some of you. Anyway, the electric field strong enough can strip an electron away from the neon atom creating a positively charged neon, ion, and a free electron. So this process is what leads to the trans, uh, formation of plasma. And that first electron is relatively easy to remove, but subsequent ionizations require significantly more energy. The ionization energy increases because the positively charged nucleus holds onto the remaining electrons more tightly once the first electron is removed. I'll let that sink in for a sec. So obviously to achieve higher levels of ionization, like I said, more energy must be invested into the system. And I hope this makes sense to you so far. <sighs> I said before, these plasmas are not definitely not exclusive to hydrogen. They can be formed from any atom, really. So when an electron is stripped from an atom, it leaves behind a positively charged ion, as well as a free electron creating a plasma. So this uh, phenomenon is pretty evident. Neon signs and other shit, but maybe not so much another phenomenon. I think one of the most intriguing aspects of plasma is there, you know, and lots of other people excited about the potential for clean energy production through alleged fusion reactors. So fusion reactors obviously aim to recombine hydrogen nuclei to generate vast amounts of clean energy without radioactive waste or even the risk of a meltdown, obviously, because provided their design correctly. Talking recently in a presentation of mine, my last, second last quantum news, I think, talking about tungsten linings. They're all upgrading these tokamak linings, reactor linings. Anyway, so it's fusion reactors uh, to, uh, anyway, Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here. Despite these promising benefits, you know, constructing a fusion reactor is obviously pretty challenging. Um, plasmas are notoriously difficult to control. A common analogy used by physicians is that uh, managing a plasma is like trying to manipulate jello with a piece of string. You can imagine how that goes. You know, imagine trying to move the jello from one bowl to another using only a string. Right. So definitely illustrates the complexity of controlling plasmas, which are electrically conductive and thus resist straightforward manipulation attempts. So charged particles like these protons, electrons are the source of electric fields. The stationary charge creates an electric field radiating outward from itself. But when these charges are in motion, they also generate a magnetic field. If I had to explain that shit to you, if that was new to you, you're following the wrong account. This is the dual nature of electric and magnetic fields. Stationary charges produce electric fields while Moving charges create magnetic fields. I'll say that again. 
Let it sink in. Stationary charges produce electric fields, while moving charges create magnetic fields. So, in plasma, though, this dual nature leads to pretty complex interactions. <laughs> to say it nicely, these uh, electric fields produced by the charged particles exert forces on neighboring particles or charges, sorry. You know, and this causes them to move, obviously. And as these particles move, they generate magnetic fields, which in turn exert forces on other particles. Big domino effects, so. Magnetic forces act perpendicular to the direction of a magnetic field, leading to a chaotic wavy motion within the plasma that we're all familiar with. This uh, instability is a significant challenge in trying to contain plasma in a fusion reactor. I'm not going to go into that. So obviously the goal is to try to control the plasma so that the fusion can occur, but the plasma's inherent electric and magnetic properties make it resistant to confinement. Resistant as fuck, you ask me. It's like trying to hold on to something that constantly pushes back in weird, unpredictable ways. I say good luck to them. So these charged particles, like protons and electrons, they naturally electrons. Protons are feeling outwards, while the electrons field points inwards. Um, if another charged particles placed nearby it'll uh it'll be pushed along these field lines it's either repelled or attracted depending on its charge so when charged particles move they create magnetic fields these movements like can do a electric current follows the right hand rule if you point your thumb in the direction of the current the moving proton your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field forming the circular pattern around the charge. The interplay between the electric and magnetic fields leads to complex behaviors in plasma. So as these particles move and generate magnetic fields, these fields exert forces perpendicular to the direction of motion, causing instability and unpredictable movements. This is why controlling plasma, you know, like infusion reactions and Mode rocket propulsion is uh, so challenging. But despite the difficulties, uh, the pursuit of mastering plasma control is definitely crucial. Fusion power promises a clean and virtually limitless energy source like we'll ever see that. But you know, the goal is to replicate the sun's alleged processes on Earth, creating reactors that and harness his power safely and efi uh, efficiently. Um, anyway, this is my little introduction to plasma here underscores the fascinating nature and the reasons are so integral to advancements in science, engineering, all sorts of shit. It's an invitation here to explore more about plasmas and their potential to revolutionize our future, but more realistically, hopefully I helped you to understand our world subsequently, the universe a little better. Hopefully my ramblings uh, reach somebody. There's nobody in my room, but that's okay. I'm recording this space, like I said. Um, I'm going to do a follow-up lecture soon. Just getting some notes together and trying to make something that Sounds good after this and makes sense. And I want to incorporate the local sun and moon. So that's something to look forward to. Um, if you're listening to this, thanks a lot. And uh, see you on X.